it's such a privilege to be here. Man, this lights are really bright. Um, to be here with you guys today. Um, when I first got asked to speak here, I wondered what I'd share, and then they told me the theme was with, and I thought, no problem. I could talk about God with us all day long, or for 25 minutes, which is when you guys will be dismissed. Um, at around 1 a.m. last night, I sent out a tweet saying if anyone was up, and of the praying kind, I could surely use some, because while I can talk about God with us, sometimes I don't feel like God is with me. Um, and last night felt that way. I was having a panic attack and loads of anxiety. Um, I was in my hotel room. I was on the Voxer app, voxing um, some close friends and saying, can you please rally? Because um, I've been here for about a week and um, have been speaking and meeting and doing authory things. And everything that could go wrong has kind of gone wrong. Um, I spoke at a conference for Asian American Christian women leaders on Saturday. And Friday night, me and my roommates had to evacuate the hotel at 1.30 in the morning because of some kind of toxic mold situation which triggered our asthma. I had us all gasping and coughing in the lobby while we were trying to get our refund and get out of there. Um, and then to figure out where we were gonna sleep. Uh, by the time we got settled in another, another uh, hotel with other conference speakers, it was already the middle of the night and um, I don't think any of us really slept that night. So um, it's that thing where you're laying in bed and you're counting the hours. Okay, if I go to sleep right now, I will still get four hours. Okay, okay, if I go to sleep right now, three and a half hours, that's solid. I can work with three and a half. And then the, you finally fall asleep and the alarm goes off like that second. So that was really the situation Friday night. And then all day Saturday I was speaking. Um, like my bio says, I wrote a book called Glorious Weakness. And let me just tell you, it is all fun and games until you're up at 3 a.m. and the next morning you're gonna speak to like 500 college students and you're slightly delirious from sleep deprivation. Um, so I did not sleep at all last night. Um, this is not ideal. I would like just once to not have some um, major or minor catastrophe occur right before every speaking event. Um, because it kind of leaves me flustered and awkward, and I have enough of that on my own. Um, when I was sending in my bio, um, I, I did crowdsource Twitter, and I was like, how do I write an academic bio? Because um, I am a high school dropout. And um, I remember the first time somebody asked to see my CV, and I was like, Google, what is a CV? Um, I sent in a bio and I referred to 2 Corinthians 2, 3, and 5. I was with you in weakness and in fear and in much trembling, and my message and my preaching were not in persuasive words of wisdom, but in demonstration of the spirit and of power, so that your faith would not rest on the wisdom of men, but on the power of God. And I was honestly not expecting God to call me on that so spectacularly. Um, no one actually wants a ministry of weakness, but we're all called to it. Still, I thought that I would have a little of my own mojo. You guys, I have no mojo. I am completely mojo-less. Um, someone sent me this as an encouragement, and maybe it will encourage you too this morning, especially if you're feeling particularly busted up, which it sounds like there's been a lot of stuff going on on this campus. It's a John Newton quote. Some Christians are called to endure a disproportionate amount of suffering. Such Christians are a spectacle of grace to the church, like flaming bushes unconsumed, and cause us to ask, like Moses, why is this bush not burned up? The strength and stability of these believers can be explained only by the miracle of God's sustaining grace. The God who sustains Christians in unceasing pain is the same God with the same grace who sustains me in my smaller sufferings. We marvel at God's persevering grace and grow in our confidence in him as he governs our lives. So in weakness, with much fear and trembling and sleep deprivation, I am praying that if nothing else, you will see the spectacle of grace that is the goodness of God in my life. 
So I'm here with you a lot tired and a bit weary, and there was no amount of concealer or visine that was gonna fix all this. But honestly, um, you think I'd know by now that if you write a book about weakness, God will give you lots of material to work with. Um, as someone living with mental and chronic illness, I realize it's not only okay, but necessary to have stories that reside in the tension of a God who saves, but doesn't always heal, who walks with us when we feel pierced, but doesn't always remove the thorn, a God who promises he can be known, but not always understood, a God who promises when I am weak, then he is strong, and let's hope when I am sleep deprived, he provides clarity. Stripped of my autonomy of an abled body and a sound mind, of bootstraps I might have grasped to hoist myself up to some semblance of respectability, I am instead poor in spirit, a poverty out of my control, unfixed by better life choices, piety or pretense. I must reckon with beggarliness. But God does not expect us to re remain stoic when our hearts are rent. We are not asked to put our masks back on so that we don't embarrass God with our suffering. We are not better Christians when we call the hardest parts of life good, but we can learn to call God good in the hardest parts of our lives. I desired God's strength, never realizing it would coalesce with my weakness, indeed depend on it. We want the happy ending, we want the after story, but what if you're not in the before or the after? What if you're called to live in the still, in the abiding tension of walking in weakness with God and allowing his strength to carry you? Especially on days today when my capacity is so small and I feel weak, I think of the brokenness of my body and the brokenness of my mind and I long for Eden. I long for a space without pain, without sorrow, without mental illness, or nights without sleep, without the possibility of embarrassing myself in front of 500 students and um, being posted on YouTube, all my people to watch and be like, oh, what's happening there? Um, when we long for heaven, we think of a garden restored. We believe all things will be made right again. But even as these things are being reconciled to Christ, Instead of a story of Eden-like perfection, I find that for me, it's another garden that brings me comfort, um, especially as I've struggled with mental and chronic illness. Uh, to look to Eden and to look, look for reconciliation and look at how Christ is bringing you, I totally believe that is true. And yet in this life, I walk with a limp. With this life, I need comfort for now. There have been countless times I've battled deep, deep depression and I felt abandoned in the darkness. I wrote, I can almost feel my bones go soft in my spine and the curved weight of my shoulders as they slump forward. My mind becomes filled with shadows of life instead of the real thing. My bed holds me hostage. I can't find sleep nor the will to rise. My leaden body cumbersome like an anchor that can't go any deeper but never hits bottom. Its chain just keeps spinning on its reel like it's lost in the abyss forever and altogether too heavy to pull back on deck. So I stare at the blank wall before me, sometimes for hours, sometimes through entire days and nights, looking into a distance that doesn't exist and seeing nothing but the worst fears of my mind played out before me. A world better off without me Better if I just let myself sink one last time, cut the tethers, toss off the floats, let my legs still and my eyes close and my breath stop. I stop, I say the word suicidal in spaces where my kids' artwork hangs on the walls and flowers still bloom outside my bedroom window, in spaces where my husband rubs my back every night and puts lotion on my feet, in spaces where I am loved in spaces where I say my prayers and read my Bible and believe, I say depression is back and I need help again. And it's in those dark times when I think of Gethsemane, 
a garden where Jesus was in such anguish, he literally sweat blood. The anxiety in his psyche so severe that it overwhelmed his human flesh. You guys, that is next level. He prayed for the cup to pass, but loved us so fully that he would obediently drink from it. In this, I saw a God who gets it, who gets me, who knows what it feels like to cry out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? One of the greatest declarations of our faith is acknowledging those times when God feels horrifically absent and crying out to him anyway. It's difficult to feel God's love when it feels like he's abandoned us and we're suffering. Indeed, the goodness of God in the face of suffering is one of the internal questions. It's left people in terror that God may be no better than us, petty and irrational, sovereign but not compassionate, kind but impotent, withdrawn and passive aggressive, a God who has gold stars for the ones who get things right and detention for those who fall short. But Jesus knows the lies that we're tempted to believe. His promise to send a comforter to comfort us anticipates that our lives will be filled with grief and sorrow, with confusion and cliffhangers, with panic attacks alone in hotel rooms in the middle of the night, with broken bodies, and the great and formidable why. Why would we need a comforter unless he knew we would be uncomfortable? Unless he knew we would need comforting? It's the swipe of Jesus' sweaty brow leaving a blood-covered hand that trespasses on my sorrow. Sometimes everything hurts. Sometimes I have no answers. Sometimes I'm living in the Psalms and God is very hidden from me. There's a poverty in me, a deep, abiding hunger, of a poor soul, a desperation for God. And it's not just about Bible verses and making good life choices. It's not about doing more for God or having it all together, clearly. Days like today, I wonder, am I strong enough to live the life I've been given? And God's answer to me is, I am with you always. I know a God who sits with me in the dark so that I can bear witness to the light. I saw an interview with Stephen Colbert and and Anderson Cooper once. Um, This was like maybe a year ago. Um, And it was kind of making the rounds. And Anderson Cooper says, you told an interviewer that you have learned to, in your words, love the thing that I most wish had not happened. You went on to say, what punishments of God are not gifts? Do you really believe that? And Colbert answered with this. Yes, it's a gift to exist, and with existence comes suffering. There's no escaping that. You can't pick and choose what you're grateful for, and then so what do you get from loss? You get awareness of other people's loss, which allows you to connect with that other person, which allows you to love more deeply, and to understand what it's like to be a human being if it's true that all humans suffer. And so at a young age, I suffered something so that by the time I was in serious relationships in my life, with friends or with my wife or with my children, some understanding that everybody is suffering and however imperfectly acknowledge their suffering and to connect with them and to love them in a deep way that not only accepts that all of us suffer, but also then makes you grateful for the fact that you have suffered so that you can know that about other people. It's the fullness of your humanity. What's the point of being here and being human if you can't be the most human you can be? And that involves acknowledging and ultimately being grateful for the things that I wish didn't happen because they gave me a gift. And then he says this, and in my tradition, that's the great gift of the sacrifice of Christ is that God does it too, that you're really not alone God does it too. We have no fairy tale ending this side of eternity. Life aches and it overwhelms, we suffer. To flourish, we often look for Eden-like perfection. We look for the after story, we look for the healing, we look for the provision. There is no solution 
to pain, only a companion. Sometimes when we have a crisis of faith where the darkness feels too deep, I think of Gethsemane. In Matthew 26, 38, it says, then he said to them, my soul is overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death. Stay here and keep watch with me. And these words really resonate with me because overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death is something that with bipolar depression, I understand. And to know that a God not only gets that about me, but that has gone through that for me and with me means he's a God that I can turn to when I'm in the worst kind of pain. In one of the footnotes, it said, my soul is swallowed up in sorrow. And I have felt that. Some of you have probably felt that too. But like Colbert said, the gift is God does it too. We don't do it alone. And when we grasp the enormity of Christ with us, we begin to more fully understand what with actually means. When Jesus says, stay here and keep watch with me, there's a presence that he's asking for. God is not just with us, but he's inviting us to be with him, to be a body, a people, a church, a bride. Are we people who bear one another's burdens well? Or do we spend most of our time trying to convince them that it couldn't possibly be that heavy or that they don't have that much longer to go? Sometimes I wonder if all our pep talks are really more to insulate ourselves from the reality that sometimes we have no answers for suffering. But I know this, presence matters. Withness matters. When I publish my book, sometimes publishers will send out these little package gifts, things um, that most people probably throw away, but it's supposed to get people to share your book and do the marketing, whatever. And I was trying to think about what I can send with my book, um, since my book is about like weakness and lack and suffering. I'm like, what gift goes well with that? Uh, scented candle? Um, and I was joking around with my daughter, and she, she, with her trademark wit and humor, just totally deadpan goes, send a vial of your tears, and an empty one to fill when they read it. And you know, so it's interactive, and I was like, <laughs> okay. Um, so I shared it on social media, it was just a joke, I thought it was hilarious. And then all these people were like, oh my gosh, that's amazing, you should do that, I always cry when I read. And I was like, is this like a real thing? <laughs> so, um, I mean, I don't even write in coffee shops anymore because the baristas are I'm like ugly crying into my laptop and they're like, we need to call somebody for her. Um, so my daughter had, had come up with this idea and then people were like, no, really, this is legit, like marketing people that know stuff. And they're called lacry lacrimatory jars, it's a thing. And here's something fascinating I learned about tears in my bottling quest. Uh, we have different tears for different purposes. I don't know if there's like sciencey people in here that knew this and they're like, oh, you know. Um, but this was new to me. Um, emotional tears are unique. Emotional tears triggered by an overwhelming feeling, whether positive or negative, contain protein based hormone, hormones, including the neurotransmitter, I'm gonna screw this up, leucine. In kephalin, a natural painkiller. Physically expressing our deepest emotions is intentional and crying helps us heal. Not only that, emotional tears don't get reabsorbed by our lower lids like other tears. Instead, they spill out of our eyes, run down our cheeks, make us sniffle, drain from our nose. Like the, ug the real legit ugly cry, right? I didn't wear like very much mascara just in case today because I was like, I might, who knows? Um, it's not discreet, it is not subtle, it is very obvious. And I know this because I'm the queen of ugly crying, but also, quoting Harold Ivan Smith's talk about tear catches, he said, it's like God meant for such tears to be seen by others. Being seen and understood goes a long way toward killing the pain, and there's a reason that we're called to rejoice with those who rejoice and weep with those who weep. Sometimes I sit in the dark with God, in the death of dreams and the disaster of middle spaces. And I say this tenderness, this holy ache, this wailing sorrow is not our great liability. This 
is our gift, the cost, costliest one we're gonna ever carry because unwrapped, it's opening to another's pain and offering in return our burdened, broken hearts as a corporate place to lament together as a community, as a body, as a church, as a bride. And God invites us into that. No tears lost. We carry them together, sometimes in little jars called lacrimatory. Um, in Psalm 56, eight, David writes, you have taken account of my wanderings, put my tears in your bottle, are they not in your book? You guys, it's biblical. Lacrimatory jar. Um, I'm not a theologian or scholar or even an academic, but when I read the verse in Matthew 26, 38 in preparation for today, I kept focusing on Jesus' words to his disciples, stay here and keep watch with me. The word stay, keep, with, these all resonated with me because they're all words of presence. They're all an invitation to enter in. If you find yourself surrounded by darkness, or sorrow (laughs) swallowing you whole, we get to look to Gethsemane. See Jesus entering into the darkness with us, a man of sorrow willing to drink from this cup for us. We don't do it alone. God is with us always. In the words of St. Teresa of Avila, govern us by your wisdom, O Lord, so that my soul always may be serving you in the way you will and not as I choose. Let me die to myself so that I may serve you. Let me live to you who are life itself. Amen. Discover who you're called to be at Biola University, a leading Christ-centered university in Los Angeles, with programs on campus and online. Subscribe for more of our videos and learn more at biola.edu.